When emergency first responders were overwhelmed by Los Angeles County's most destructive fire yet, a band of surfers, along with their neighbors and friends, stepped up to defend their home turf in Malibu. Their devotion to home drove them to show up for their community during the fire and for years afterward. And now, a model they call the Community Brigade Program could change everything leading to more lives and more homes saved during the increasing wildfires across not just California, but the world. Join reporter Adriana Cargill from KCRW, NPR's All Things Considered, Crooked Media, and more, as she investigates a wildfire story that is not depressing, but is, in fact, a clear hope for the future. Listen now to Sandcastles, an award-winning podcast about home, how we create it, and why we fight so hard for it. Hi everyone, Quinn here. Today we're replaying episode number 79, Air Pollution, the low-hanging fruit of our hellish future. Our guest for this episode was Beth Gardner. Uh, She's the author of Choked, which is out in paperback now. Uh, The Guardian said, you couldn't ask for a better guide for concerned citizens, which pretty much sums up our audience. Um, We are replaying this fan favorite today because of two timely reasons. Uh, One, While we obviously know that breathing dirty air damages our health, it also appears to, uh, not surprisingly, create underlying conditions that dramatically elevate the risk of complications from diseases like COVID-19. Also related to this, Trump just rolled back Obama's vehicle tailpipe rules, which should, uh, per the Washington Post, quote, amount to as much as 923 million more metric tons of carbon dioxide being emitted and is equivalent to the emissions from running 237 coal power plants for a year, according to the EPA's own online calculator. So this all in the context that air pollution is maybe the single easiest thing we can change with regard to the climate crisis. So if you're new here, Please enjoy this conversation with Beth. Grab your action steps and get to it. Uh, And for everyone, it would mean the world to us if you could share this podcast with one person today. Uh, You can do that right from whatever your app is. Hit that little share button. Text it, select it, whatever you want to do. Personal recommendations go the farthest. And you guys are about as loyal as it gets. So thanks in advance. You've helped us. uh, You've helped keep us. Uh, in the top three most recommended science shows in Overcast, which is crazy, and it feels really special. So again, please share the show with uh, somebody today and help grow our community. Uh, Enjoy our conversation with Beth Gardner. Welcome to Important Not Important. My name is Quinn Emmett. And I'm Brian Colbert Kennedy. We're back! We're back! This is the podcast where we try our damn best to bend the arc of goddamn history towards progress. And together we're going to dive into a specific topic or question affecting everyone on the planet right now or in the next 10 years or so. Uh, If it can kill us, make the future a hell of a lot cooler for everyone, we are in. You really like the phrase, bend the arc lately. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We'll get into that. In our fun guests, talk. Fantastic. I can't wait. Yep. Our guests are scientists, doctors, engineers, politicians, astronauts, journalists. We had a reverend once, and we work together toward action steps that our listeners can take with their voice, their vote, and their dollar. Today, folks, you and us, we're going to change the world just a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is your friendly reminder. You can send questions, thoughts, ransom notes, and feedback to us on Twitter at importantnotimp, or you can email us at funtalk at importantnotimportant.com. Uh, you can also join thousands of other smart people and subscribe to our free weekly newsletter at importantnotimportant.com. Our guest today is Beth Gardner. Mm-hmm. She's a journalist, and her new book, Choked Life and Breath in the Age of Air Pollution, is out now. Go Everywhere. get it. Uh, and today we're going to talk a little bit about why she wrote it, mm-hmm. uh, how we got to this place that mm-hmm. we are right now, mm-hmm. and uh, how we're actually getting out of it. Because we are. Yeah. In a lot of places. Not in all of them, but we are. There's progress to be seen, and as she notes, this is one of those places where you can see change happening. You can see it at, right. like, like, very quickly. Right. You can feel it. You can breathe it. And we have examples of how to do it and how it's worked. And where we still have to go. And that's what's so fucking tantalizing about it. Yeah. 
is we can do that. There's optimism in the air, which makes uh, nice. all of our That's episodes. a great pun. Really nice. Yeah. Anyways, uh, not to give it away, that is uh, our guest today, Beth Gardner. We're excited to be back. And uh, let's go talk to her. Let's do it. Our guest today is Beth Gardner. And together we're going to ask, uh, air pollution, really bad or really, really, really bad? Uh, Beth, welcome. Hi, great to be with you guys. We are very excited to have you. Very excited. Um, Same here. Good, good. Uh, Beth, if you can uh, get us started by just um, letting everybody know who you are and what you do. Sure. So I am a journalist, an environmental journalist. I'm American, but I've lived in London for a really long time, almost 19 years. And I just published my first book, which is called Choked Life and Breath in the Age of Air Pollution. It's a global look at the health dangers of air pollution. It kind of mixes together science and politics and stories of people who are affected and people who are trying to fight for change. And you know, I guess I feel like this is a really important issue that doesn't get enough coverage and attention. And I've tried to write it in a way that's going to be readable and interesting for, you know, general readers, regular people, not just like wonky environmentalists. So that's kind of what I'm about right now. Uh, I love it. And congratulations on your book. It's very exciting. Has gotten a really preposterous number and level of positive reviews <laughs> uh, from both the scientific community, but also... Uh, the mainstream media, as they say, um, folks seem to and rightfully find it as both uh, necessary, which it certainly is, uh, but also very well done and executed um, and very readable, which is awesome. Um, I Cool. Well, that's great to hear. Thank you. I've basically spent the last, I don't know, five, six, seven months pitching my butt off, wow. um, trying to get coverage for the book and using all of my contacts and sort of ideas from, I don't know, 12 or something years of freelancing and, uh, you know, 20 something as a journalist. So, um, yeah, it's paid off. I feel like it's gotten some great attention and I feel like, you know, this is something that people care about and maybe are a little bit, I don't know, shocked when they read. Actually, I was shocked when I started to learn how not only how much, but how many different ways air pollution affects us in terms of health. Yeah, and we're going to get into that. And and I think we we discussed a little bit up front. And part of the reason I feel like we get it, besides, again, just being in this business, is, um, again, besides your professional uh, interest and, and association with it, you live in a place, uh, and, and we live in a place, that's affected by it every single day. Um, they're not uh, Delhi uh, or, or Beijing, but um, they're not far off in a lot of ways, in a lot of moments. And... Uh, LA in, in a lot of ways has been worse in the past and is still not great. And I don't think a lot of people realize that. <laughs> um, so it's pretty necessary to talk about. Yeah, definitely. And I really did come to this story through my own, you know, personal experience of air pollution, not fortunately in in the sense of having had any, you know, health problems in myself or in my family related to it, but just living in a place where every day I walk out on the street and you can really smell the fumes, um, London and, and Europe more widely be, because the air pollution problem here is really about diesel. And diesel is just a really, really thick, heavy sort of just gross, um, you know, gives this thickness to the air um, that you you can smell and feel in a way that's always bothered me. Um, you know, you're right, definitely, to say that in, in the developed world, in wealthy countries like the U.S., Western Europe, you know, our air pollution is nothing compared to um, what you see if you go to developing countries, particularly um, in Asia. India really now is sort of the global you know, ground zero for air pollution. Sure. So we are way, way, way better off than that. But nonetheless, this is still something that that kills a lot of people. And, um, you know, when I say that I came to it, it through personal experience, it's always bothered me in London. Even when I first moved here 18, 19 years ago, mm. I'd like walk out of my office to go get lunch or something. And I just get this sort of grittiness on my teeth and like a little bit sometimes almost lightheaded or headachey. And I had come from New York, so it wasn't like I was comparing right. <laughs> it to some, you know, rural I ideal or anything, but it always bothered me. No one really around me ever seemed to be talking about it. London obviously has the sort of you know, famous history with air pollution and the great smog in the 1950s that was more to do with coal. 
And those problems have sort of been solved. No one talked about it. And I kind of thought, oh, I guess, you know, it's just me. I'm imagining it, you know, oversensitive American or whatever. So I kind of just pushed it out of my mind. And then like years later, around actually the the 2012 Olympics, which were coming to London, I I was doing an article that had to do with air quality vis-a-vis the athletes. And I literally, it only took me five minutes of sitting down and Googling to read about what the air quality was like in London and the science of what air pollution does to your bodies. And my jaw really started dropping because it's shocking. If you, you know, did that, I think you'd be shocked too. It, you you will learn that air pollution is linked to everything from, you know, heart attacks and strokes to dementia, premature birth, and right up to and including premature death. You know, when sure. air pollution rates go up, more people die. So obviously that bothered me. This is a place where I live. I have a child. I, as a parent, it's worrying. But also as a journalist, it struck me as a big story, you know, and something that wasn't really being sufficiently told because why was this something that, you know, the the numbers are like the latest study in London is that 9,000 Londoners every year die early from air pollution globally. Globally, 7 million people in the U.S., 100,000 Americans die every year from air pollution. That's like a lot of people, right? So why are we not hearing about it? Why is that not on the front page every day, sure. that's more than, you know, are killed by so many other things. So yeah. I felt like there's a story here and I, I kind of started following it. I love it. Yeah. And and again, we'll get into it. But I mean, America, of course, which is completely broken. Uh, you know, we there were apparently six uh, vaping deaths in the past year, which to be clear, six people, that's terrible. However, in the context of premature deaths from air pollution or just shit, I mean, let's count the kids in uh, Los Angeles with asthma, uh, you know, which are all low income, low income or uh, or gun deaths. It feels like the move to write an executive order uh, mm-hmm. on six deaths of vaping feels like, boy, uh, we we <laughs> priorities kind of all over the place at this point. But that feels like the least of our problems. Um, anyways, we're going to get into that. Yeah. Uh, Brian, talk about the show a little bit today. So Beth, what we're gonna uh, P- P- Quinn is prepared just a wonderful little summary, um, and who we'll go over some context. Uh, <laughs> it's it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> and we what well, we we're super happy to have you just pop in at any time to correct him if he makes any mistakes about data. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, definitely. So we'll go over that, and then uh, we'll get into uh, some some action oriented uh, questions that get to um, uh, the the heart of why we should all care about what you're doing and the work that you're doing, um, and then what we can uh, all do about it. If that sounds all right. Uh, okay, definitely. That sounds awesome. Awesome. Rock and roll. Uh, Beth, we do like to start with one important question to set the tone a little bit. Uh, instead of saying, tell us your life story, as, as lovely as that must be, um, we actually lived in London at the same time. I just realized I was there for a little while. Beth, uh, why are you vital to the survival of our species? Um, <laughs> I'm, de- I'm definitely not vital. <laughs> Come on, be um, bold. I'm definitely not vital at all. I mean, I... You know, like I said, I think this story is is vital and is a really important one. And one thing that definitely I think we should talk about is how it's interconnected with the the, the existential, you know, pr- threat that we face today of climate change. Air pollution definitely is, you know, on its own, killing all these people, a really important story. Um, but it's it's deeply interconnected with climate change, which is, you know, beyond important and and right up there to existential. But I, you know, I'm not an activist. I'm not like out there on the front lines fighting against air pollution, fighting for cleaner air. I've met and interviewed and put in my book, like lots and lots of people who are um, and scientists who are are studying this and helping us understand it and what to do about it. And I've talked to politicians and regulators who are, you know, taking the steps that we need to deal with it or not taking the steps that we need to deal with it or undoing the steps. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm a journalist. So I guess that makes me a little bit of an outsider or an observer. And I've tried to to tell this because I think, like I said, that's a really important story that's not gotten enough attention. And I guess, you know, I've been doing this long enough that I, I guess I do believe that, you know, good information and an understanding of of the issues that we face and an understanding of the world around us is really a prerequisite for action. So, you know, I, I reported the story. I, I wrote the book. I tried to 
tell it as accurately and as also interestingly and I hope readably as I could. And then, you know, I, I guess I put it out there and I it's up to people what they want to do with it. But at least I've helped them, I think, to understand it. So I don't know. Yeah, I'm a journalist. I'm not I'm <laughs> not I'm not out in the trenches. Sure. But I, um, I guess, uh, you know, talking to the people who are. Sure. But that's, uh, you know, that is what's so wonderful and necessary uh, and rightfully limited about journalism, right? You're not picking sides inherently. You are um, doing your best to uncover, to to discover a little bit like you did the when you were looking at, uh, you know, the 2012 uh, era around the Olympians. Yeah. And, and then to uncover that more and to, to really build, you know, build a, a dossier of information so that so that it then can be explained to people so that they can do what they need to do with it if there is anything to do with it. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, there's all this kind of discussion and debate, I think, nowadays about, you know, what is the role of the journalist and, quote, you know, unquote, being objective. Sure. Um, and what does that really mean? And, you know, obviously there's no one's objective. We're all human. Sure. And I think there's really important decisions that get made in in journalism of, you know, what, what do we cover and what do we talk about and what's worth reporting on and what's worth our attention? Mm-hmm. You know, and I totally take my hat off to all the journalists who are, are covering politics, you know, in both of my countries on both sides of, of the Atlantic and all the, you know, breaking news that's just like totally bananas every day. I mean, all of that is so important. But I think also amidst the tumult, it's important um, that that some of us also be kind of keeping our eye on some of the issues that are maybe a little bit more hidden and a little bit more long term. Climate change, obviously, you know, none of what we're screaming and yelling about today is is going to matter in the long run of, you know, Right. decades right. And, and centuries and millennia if the world becomes uninhabitable. And similarly, you know, if we don't have clean air to breathe, that's killing people just as much as any other, you know, terrible thing sure. in the news is. Yeah, and, and so we, uh, we, I've tried to sort of shine my lens, I guess, in, the, in a place that I don't think is getting enough attention. T- I mean, totally agree. It's the entire reason we exist, which is like, I, 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 worked, for the fina- I worked for the Financial Times when I was in London. Like, I, I, I yeah. am... A product of and love journalism, and and uh, again, like you, I I both tip my hat and feel horrible, horribly uh, sympathetic for the people that are covering the breaking news that is every day. Yeah, because uh, it is relentless. There is no downtime. Certainly on either side of the pond right now. I mean, uh, I can't imagine what it looks like from the out, from the outside looking at these two countries on a day to day basis. But there are these huge underlying things uh, that don't change day to day, except for that. They're getting worse. And and even as a journalist, you have to, and we'll get into this, look at these things and go, I'm presenting an objective fact that is something that is actually affecting my life because it's affecting everyone's lives, not just in my city, right. not just everywhere. So I am giving you the, the clearest case uh, possible of what's happening, not necessarily what we should do, but also know that, um, you know, it's again, it's why we got into this because these are the things that are that are affecting everybody. And, and we talk about where, from whether it's antibiotic stuff here or we talk about uh, climate, it's, it's, these things are inescapable. And that's why we you know, thread a bunch of action into it because we're, we're happy to take all the incredible work that, that you guys do and stand on your shoulders and say, these are the things we need to do to, to fight them and deal with them. Um, because obviously yeah. we don't have those journalism chops by, I mean, by any stretch. You know, my handwriting is terrible, especially Brian. Yeah. I mean, that's a different topic. Sure. Um, oh, my handwriting is terrible too. <laughs> no, but you know, it's a, it's a requirement. Anyway, well, yeah. we 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 appreciate it, and I'm I'm excited to dig into that a little bit today. And and we've talked about air, yeah. uh, about air pollution here uh, before, and I want to take a bit of a different tact with it today. But just for some yeah, uh, quick background for for people who aren't around it every day, or again, it's easy to look around and move to Los Angeles and be like, everybody said smog gate's not that bad. Well, it's, it's still not great. What's uh, air pollution, right? It's pollutants in the air. And and just so you know, Beth, basically what I try to do with this section is really for our users who are all texting and driving, uh, just not dumb it down, but get everybody on the same page so that they can understand the conversation we're about to have. Uh, yeah. It's, it's air pollution is particles and gases uh, that can reach harmful concentrations both outside and inside 
Uh, we don't have a ton of the inside issues in the U.S., uh, but there's a lot of places uh, in the world that do. But um, we're talking about soot and smoke and uh, mold and pollen and methane and carbon dioxide. On the U.S., we measure them with uh, something called the Air Quality Index or the AQI. Uh, I'm not sure what you guys call it over there. I assume there's some similar measure. But what does it measure? Uh, ground level ozone, uh, particle pollution, uh, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, uh, nitrogen yeah, dioxide. Nitri nitrogen dioxide is right. a big one in Europe and, because of diesel. Oh, yeah. Right, exactly. Diesel. That's a different mm -hmm. discussion I want to get into, which is like, the, in, in I think it was the early 90s, Europe decided to go diesel to to uh, try to prevent exactly what's happening. And turns out that didn't work out. So there are also those that, that contribute to, again, indoor air pollution. Uh, people who are cooking inside, but also there's radon and cigarette smoke and uh, uh, formaldehyde and asbestos, all these things. But the big guys uh, are what we're really talking about today. So uh, how is it going? It's not... Go ahead, but please interrupt whenever. Yeah, right. So yeah, so you you tossed out a lot of the names of all the different pollutants and you know that's great and it's important to know what they are or I don't know, maybe it's not important. But I mean, you know, you can... I think in a way sort of step back and forget about, you know, micrograms per cubic meter and right. all this other kind of, you know, technical language that I really tried to stay away from yeah. in the book because I feel like it totally turns people off, understandably. And it really comes down to mostly burning and mostly burning of fossil fuels. Right. Um, and, you know, what, what I think and the way that I framed it in the book and the thing that really connects this issue to climate change is that I think we have we have built our world, our modern world, on a foundation of fossil fuels. Yeah. You know, fossil fuels drove the Industrial Revolution, right? They get us around wherever we need to go every day. There's, you know, gas power plants that are, sure. you know, keeping our computers charged. And, and that that's what has delivered prosperity and, and, you know, built the modern world, really. But it's a, it's a dirty foundation to have built on. Sure. And it's an unhealthy foundation to have built on. And I think most of us sort of in the reality-based, you know, world get now that fossil fuels are what's driving climate change. Sure. Um, but what I really learned in, in writing and reporting this book is that they also are the very same thing that is making us sick and literally killing people right now. But I just want to go back to one thing and, and, and correct actually something that you said earlier, Destroy it. which is that, which is that it's getting worse. It's actually not getting worse. It's getting better. Mostly. Um, obviously it depends where you are, but if you're talking about Europe and the U S right. the U S has been sliding backwards now the last year or a couple of years. But if you take a little bit of a broader trajectory and look back about 50 years to 1970 when the Clean Air Act was passed, which is, in in my view, and I devote a whole chapter to it in the book, one of America's, I think, most consequential modern laws. Mm -hmm. We have air now that is so much cleaner than it was sure. back in 1970. You know, you in L.A., people use the description, and, and I think it's very justified that, that L.A. In, in particular, L.A.'s um, improvement with smog is one of the great environmental success stories of all time. I think that's true. And, and you could actually apply that, you know, description to the U S as a whole, we are actually sort of a, a story of, I don't want to say success because it's an, an unfinished story, but <laughs> right. a story of, of real progress. Sure. Literally the clean air act, you know, studies have shown has saved millions of American lives and trillions of dollars in the past 50 years. And it's now become a model that other countries around the world are looking to. Places like China that are struggling with their own air quality problems are looking to the U.S. They're looking to California in particular and saying, you know, how did that happen? What, what do we need to do? Sure. What can we learn from that? So, you know, this is a, obviously we're living in times of all this tumult and, and you know, fear and, and anxiety and, and a sense, I think, that everything's going the wrong direction and we're sort of powerless to fix it. But actually, I think if you just look back, you know, a few short decades, you, you actually see, you know, a really imperfect but functioning American system of government. The Clean Air Act was passed on a bipartisan basis. It actually passed the Senate unanimously, <laughs> one no vote in the House of Representatives. Which is crazy today. 
Right. I mean, you couldn't imagine the most innocuous. Right. Right. Post office what do we want to have for lunch today? Right. Right. But, you know, this was actually a a law that gave far reaching new powers to the federal government. I mean, it's unimaginable. Republicans, you know, we're to, we're on board with it. President Nixon Incredible. signed it. He didn't really like it, but he could see sure. where the political wind was blowing and sure. he he followed that. So, you know, I mean, you could say like how far we've fallen, but you could also say like it is not out of reach to no. be able to do something like that again. You know, we've made steady progress over the years, slow kind of incremental accomplished through incredibly boring things like, yeah. you know, regulation on fuel quality and like those like sort of cap type things that go over, um, you know, when you put the gas in your car, there's this thing now that like keeps the fumes from floating oh, yeah. out. Sure. That used to be, right? That's so boring, but that used <laughs> to really contribute to smog, those fumes. Um, you know, cars now, um, American cars are 99% cleaner than they were it's incredible. in 1970 it's incredible. because of effective regulation by the federal government and also by the state of California, which has been a really important player in this story. So I, I think, you know, that sort of, is there's some optimism to be found in there because it's not impossible. And uh, the other thing about air pollution is that we know that even incremental improvement, even these little steps forward, actually really literally save people's lives. They translate directly into better health, even if you can make the air, you know, I don't know, 5%, 10%, 20% cleaner. You you see the these lines on the graphs that the death rates come down and heart attacks come down. And, you know, what more could you want in terms of like direct impact of policy change? No, and it's something, So, uh, sorry, I was just going to say, it's certainly, and that's what I want to dig into today is, is sort of the, the the decisions that have been made. And that's what I love about your book is, is, is you focus so much, not on just like these people are dead and this is better and this is better. It's like, these are the people behind and the decisions behind what made it not breathable and what has made it better. And I think that is important because, and and again, I clearly didn't have, uh, shockingly didn't use enough nuance when I talked about how things are going, uh, but they have been going so much better in so many places. Yeah. Um, no, but it's easy to feel that way. Sure. Though, well, right? it's, well, look, it's, it's like, it's it, part of it is, is for example, the internet are more earthquakes happening. Uh, we're not really sure, but we can find out about an earthquake in Indonesia in 10 seconds yeah. now where we didn't know it happened period 25 years ago uh, or we'd yeah. read about it in a book so so that's different but also uh like you said places like london are looking up and going oh wait a minute we've got a serious problem on our hands and it's because of this and this is what we're going to do and this is how we can learn from it and places like i mean we talked about india and we've talked about india a lot here you know the issues that they're dealing with um some of which are just incredible but you know again just to to, to clarify for folks and we talked about a little bit before you know Bad outdoor air caused an estimated about 4 million premature deaths in 2016, from what I could find, according to the World Health Organization. Does that sound about right? Well, there's different estimates. I've actually used the number 7 million, which also comes from the World Health Organization, but that includes what they call indoor air pollution okay, or uh, household air pollution, it sometimes gets called, which is mostly to do with these very dirty cooking fires right. in in developing countries but that's also really deeply interconnected with the outdoor air quality problem because that you know the smoke just doesn't stay indoors it it, right of course you know floats around and now that's estimated to account those cook fire cooking fires in india are estimated to account for 25 percent of the overall what's called ambient outdoor kind of regular air pollution problem so uh, that's why I use the 7 million, which is also from the World Health Organization. But, you know, 4 million, 7 million, it's a lot of people, so a lot right? Of people. That's sort of what and, those numbers tell you. And, and I know, uh, I, and one of the other things I saw, and again, please just keep correcting me because it's fantastic. It's, my favorite. Uh, it's Brian's favorite thing, is that uh, about 90% <laughs> of those are in the low and middle income countries. Does that sound about right? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know the number off the top of my but head, but, ish. you know, definitely it's, 50, it's true. 50. Yeah. Right. So, you know, we do have serious problems in here in London where I am, you know, in L.A. where you are all across the U.S., across Europe. But, you know, it's nothing compared to I mean, I went to India. It's horrendous. Um, China, China, too. China is improving now 
India is not improving, sure. but still it's, you know, unbelievable. Like you literally can't see buildings that are, I don't know, a hundred yeah. yards away from you or Man. something. Um, and the, the human toll of that is horrendous. But just one, you know, to get back to the, the thing about, is it getting better? Is it getting worse in, in the U.S.? So it's getting better for sure, you know, over the long term. But you're also not wrong, even though I did correct you. Sorry, Brian. You're also not wrong <laughs> to, to, to disappoint. You're also not wrong to say that, you know, it's getting worse because the last couple of years have shown that. And for sure, what we know when you look at Washington now is that there's these really, really aggressive regulatory rollbacks going on. Yeah. There's a new one today to do with with water rules under right. Obama that that the Trump administration is now finalizing a repeal oh, of. Excellent. So that's a separate a separate issue. But, you know, it speaks to the same thing. And, you know, that's really consequential. I think the deterioration in air quality that's been shown in the last couple of years, the American Lung Association does this annual report, and they they have started to see things getting worse again. I think it's a little too early to blame that on Trump, because there's a lag time in terms of like policy having an impact and and the data when it comes in. Of course, and they're I all tied up they, in lawsuits, anyways. But but it's yeah, but, it's, but the deterioration so far is actually being caused by climate change because these right. two things are kind of sorry to cut you off. No, no, please you know, intersecting with each other, and you know because you live out west about wildfires driven by climate change, yep. made worse and more frequent and more intense by climate change and causing huge, huge air quality problems in cities all across the Western U.S. and Canada. And also just in general, like hotter weather makes air quality worse because of particularly ozone, which is a big problem right. I know in L.A. Um, ozone isn't something that comes out of like a car's tailpipe. It's what results when all this exhaust bakes in the sun. So if you have like exhaust plus sun, you get ozone. So global warming, mm -hmm. as the temperatures go up, more sunshine is it's making air quality worse in a way that's having an immediate impact on, um, you know, people's health and people's lives. But also, I think you could definitely pretty safely predict that several years down the line, when we do start seeing the effects of this really aggressive it's not just a regulatory rollback, but also they're really shrinking the enforcement capabilities of the EPA and super, super importantly, I think, attacking the science mm -hmm. and trying to undermine the science of the EPA and the Clean Air Act. You know, we definitely are going to see the effects of that because we know that when you tighten regulations, you get better air quality. When you loosen them, it's going to get worse and it's predictable what the effect of that is, sure. you know, people die from it. Yep. And, and, and we've, gets and we've dug into it uh, a lot here, which is, you know, uh, the air might be better in Brentwood here, but uh, the urban heat issues in places like parts of Los Angeles and uh, Washington DC and Baltimore, I think NPR just did a big study yeah. there, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's everything. It's the heat. It's the lack of trees. It's the stuff coming off the tires. It's the fact that there's still 3,000 oil wells in Los Angeles, uh, most of them not in white neighborhoods. These things, like you said, uh, didn't start with Trump as bad as it might be. Uh, They're fairly endemic and in a lot of ways uh, des designed that way. But uh, I do want to dig into that a little bit because, again, so much of your book is focused on decision making and, and policy and the, and the people behind it. Basically, not just particle counts, but kind of how we got here. And and I do want to spend a few minutes because there was a really interesting, uh, I could see, I could see on its head how it could be seen as some, it's not something ridiculous, but uh, Nathan Heller in the New Yorker wrote a piece a few months ago called, uh, was the automotive era a terrible mistake? Uh, and it's, it's interesting because a little bit like coal, like you hinted at, um, we built the 20th century on the back of coal and cars, at least here in the U S uh, coal is not like solar panels, was not a difficult one to figure out. Uh, and and we, yeah. we used it. And so that's part of the reason why everyone else feels like they should be able to use it as well. The interstate highway system uh, really launched in 56 or so. And, uh, you know, for the next 34 years is where things got really interesting, where we decided not to do trains, for example. Um, so talk to me about some of the decisions that you feel like America has made in the past 60, 70 years that kind of dug us this hole and that, uh, you know, leading up to, like you mentioned, the clean air stuff uh, that hopefully won't be fully dismantled uh, before my children. Yeah, around. yeah, definitely. So one thing I definitely want to talk about, and you you touched on it in, in your 
question is this this way that air pollution intersects with inequality Mm -hmm. and racism because i i think that's really important so i think we we should definitely come back to that because it's an important theme of of my book and i think it's an important part of this story but the question about cars yeah i mean you're right we've we've created this infrastructure where right we put all of our money into roads and highways and you know all these kind of invisible decisions around you know things like zoning and tax deduction for mortgages and and redlining and, you know, starving of public transportation of funds and and the way that we have sort of laid out our roads and our world, you know, I I see it because I go back and forth a lot between the U.S. and the U.K. Mm -hmm. And like when I take a train out of London, I mean, there's more trains for one thing. Um, But when you take a train out of London, you're like going through the city and then it ends and you're like in green. And then you get to a little town that's really concentrated where, you know, all the houses are close together. And then you go out of that town and it's green again. There's like space in between the towns. And I'm from New Jersey. LA is the same, right? Like (laughs) there's no space in between the towns. (laughs) No, 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 no. (laughs) There's space between the houses, right? Right. So you need a car Sometimes a little bit. A little bit of space. So, I mean, of course, there's tons of invisible decisions that have gone into to giving us that setup, which now makes it hard for us to, you know, get out of our cars. But one one thing I really learned from reporting this book, I have a whole chapter about the auto industry because they are such an important part of this air quality story. And man, I did not really understand the auto industry is just such a recalcitrant, you know, just kind of digging their heels in, you know, fighting every attempt to regulate kind of industry for, you know, literally decades. And, you know, P.S. now they're the sort of progressive ones compared to the oil industry. Trump is trying to, you know, deregulate more than the auto industry wants to deregulate, which really tells you, I mean, they are such an an anti-regulatory industry. I mean, a, a really consequential story that that has has played out in a huge way here in Europe, in London, where I live, is this Dieselgate story. And, you know, that was one of right. those things that was like in, in the news and like in the background. And like, I don't know if I was really paying close enough attention to really like get what they did and how blatant it it's was. Insane. But Volkswagen, yeah. And it wasn't just Volkswagen, you know, they were the ones who got in legal trouble. But sure. all the companies, basically, the ones that manufacture diesels are like totally gaming the system it just like blatantly, blatantly cheating and putting Ugh. the software in their cars that detected when they were being tested. And when the cars are being tested it's in insane. like a regulator's lab, they run clean and then they go out on the road uh. and in real world conditions, literally a dozen, 20 times, you know, over the pollution limits. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that is just, I think, a, a great example of, you know, the the tenor of this industry and how hostile they've been towards regulation. You know, certainly back in the in the set in the early 70s and then in 1990 when the Clean Air Act was getting amended again, they just pushed so hard against any effort to regulate, you know, and then they're also selling people on these huge SUVs and pickups, you know, and 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 pushing the market really hard in that direction, which obviously is is really damaging from a climate perspective. But having said that, you know, when they have been forced to do it by regulation and regulation with teeth that's been, you know, properly enforced, they have actually been able to innovate and make sure. cars, you know, so much cleaner than they used to be. They finally were forced in in the 70s to take lead out of gasoline that was like that's a real win (laughs) for for public health totally and you know now obviously the question is around electric cars and interestingly vw is one of the ones who's really pushing hard on that yeah i think because they realize their you know reputation has been so badly damaged they they want to try to to turn it around but you know okay whatever the cause that's it's a good thing and that's a company that knows how to like mass produce right sure. and so you might get a cheaper electric vw than versus tesla or something yeah it's, so, and that's what's going to move the needles right it's as amazing yeah. as like uh, i mean we can do 12 podcasts on how complicated tesla is I, <laughs> and, and and elon musk like i i 
my overarching feeling is I'm thankful for them dragging us into this future, even if like the actual raw number is is still pretty small because figuring out car manufacturing, it turns out, is incredibly complicated and hard to do yeah. uh, on the mass right. level. But it, like you said, it, whatever the reason VW is doing it, whether it's the enormous mm-hmm. penalties they got, which were fair, or because of pure shame or because of their <laughs> stockholder mm-hmm. price, they have basically said, and I think the CEO had a quote the other day, which is, we're going on an electric offensive, which is, if someone like VW or or GM or whoever starts, you know, uh, the Ford with trucks can turn it around, their manufacturing capacity blows anything else right. out of the water. And that's where we see massive, massive change. Now, I think actually the huge, huge player in this industry is China, right. because China, for all of their own reasons, largely to do with their own air quality problems, but also because they want to dominate this industry as the main manufacturer, they are throwing an absolute ton of money now into electric vehicles. They want to, you know, be the the world in the, in the same way that China dominates the manufacture of solar panels now, mm-hmm. and they brought the price of solar panels down by like 90% right. in, I don't know, Ten six years, or eight yeah, years. Yeah. You know, now they're, they're throwing themselves into electric cars. And I think that, you know, we might prefer that, you know, American companies do better in that industry or move faster there. But, you know, whatever happens, I think it's pretty clear that China obviously has these huge economies of scale. And what happens there is going to have consequences elsewhere in terms of good consequences in terms of driving down the prices and probably moving forward the technology, you know, a lot faster than than we would be without them in terms of the batteries and the range and stuff like that. And a lot of that comes down to, you know, two different political systems, which is like we can't get our shit together, do anything and, you know, much less decide if we're going to regulate things or tear it apart or incentivize or or have these, uh, you know, carbon marketplaces or whatever, where China, you know, for better or worse, which is very complicated, can, as they did with plastic bags, can say, like, you have to do this. And um, what that stick can can move things. And it's also necessary because they had to seed clouds to get rid of, you know, uh, pollution for the Olympics. Like, it's not great. Well, you do hear people say in in the West, you know, half jokingly, like you just did, like, oh, at least in a, you know, sort of authoritarian system, you can actually get things done. And he was like, well, you know, not so much. I mean, yes, now China's government is actually moving on air pollution for a whole bunch of, I think, pretty complicated reasons Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I try to like delve into. But, you know, it follows decades and decades of of not moving. Um, well, it was in the other so, direction. The, you know, the, their ways. The, the yeah, stick. Their ways not great either. Yeah, the stick for forty years was grow, 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 and that's what exactly. Got yeah, yeah. They obviously now they've hit a point where you know they have to do something, yeah, like, not just done. air quality, but water quality and soil. They're just like drowning in their own toxins, so yeah. they're starting to wrestle with that. Switching from cars. Uh, for a second here, because not everybody, um, you know, made the same mistakes we did. China has so many more people than we do, and but far fewer cars per capita. And you know, of course, the big issue there has been burning coal. Um, and there's a yeah. there's a super interesting graphic uh, that we've included before that shows how um, the U.S. has, you know, created. I mean, basically all of the emissions <laughs> until about three seconds ago, uh, when China leaped ahead of everyone. We burned a shit ton of coal and then everyone else did. And the argument, which we mentioned before, is like, you know, you know, as to why they feel like they should um, uh, uh, be able to are they are compelling. And, uh, you know, that's a policy decision. Yes. It's like playing catch up. Um, Where where are we there post Paris in China and India? Well, I think what's happening, especially in China, is really interesting because you're seeing the ways that air pollution and and climate change interact. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the numbers are hard to read. And and China is very like two steps forward, one step back or two steps back, one step forward in terms of what they're doing on coal, because China now consumes half the world's coal so that their, you know, usage has huge, huge consequences for the future of the climate. And I think, you know, what we've started to see over the last few years is there they are trying to plateau it and bring it down. You know, it's not always succeeding, but roughly speaking, their coal use has started to go down. They've imposed coal caps on certain regions of the country. And, you know, what I 
sort of saw when I went there and I talked to a lot of people, it's very hard to know what's happening inside the sort of decision-making apparatus of the Chinese government because it's to- a total black box. Yeah. So you hear a lot of kind of speculating, but you know, there was a huge upswelling of anger about air pollution in sort of like 2013, 2014. The air there has been terrible for decades. But it wasn't really talked about. You know, it would be like on the news, they would say like, oh, it's bad weather today or it's foggy today. Even like people who were sort of educated and tuned in didn't even really understand the air pollution problem that they had and the the human consequences of it. But around 2013, 2014, there started to be this really big social media uprising around air pollution. And people, particularly like the urban middle classes, more educated people, were starting to understand Mm how bad it was and what, you know, getting worried about what is this doing to me? What is this doing to my kids? And they really started to get angry about it. And that was starting to come out in social media and some sort of like scattered street protests. And, you know, obviously China is not a democracy where people's, you know, where political issue gains steam and then and then you can kind of force politicians through, you know, voting <laughs> yeah, no. to do to do something about it. But there is there are ways in which politicians there and the the leadership does react to the public. And you know what a lot of smart people there told me was like the Chinese government, their biggest priority is stability. Like they need to keep things stable. Right. That's what economic growth is about. That's how they keep their hold on power. So anything that sort of threatens instability or threatens like people getting unified around a particular issue is like really, really scary to them. And I think that that's what happened with air pollution. They sensed and they saw on social media, particularly that people were really getting angry about this. And it sort of threatened to to snowball even into something that could damage their legitimacy and their ability to hold on to power. Hmm. So I think there was a decision to try to, um, you know, quash that, not so much by putting it down, but by actually doing something about the problem. And then it also dovetailed with some like economic things that were going on inside the government with like reformers seeing that they have a huge problem of like overproduction and too much debt and all these factories that were like making stuff that nobody needed just to keep, you know, jobs going and stuff. And there was a need to scale that back, but it's hard to do because then people lose their jobs. So they could sort of use air pollution like as a political cover. So it's been this, I think, super interesting, you know, dynamic where air pollution, the government has actually responded and tried to start doing something about it. They're actually really having some progress. And there's been a few years ago, I think from one year to the next, there was like double digit percentage decrease in Beijing of particulate matter and in other cities too. So that's hugely important. And even, you know, of wider global importance is what that means for global CO2. You know, China, they don't really like sort of like to, you know, be showy on the world stage and and take a leading role diplomatically. But I think sort of de facto, they're now the global leader on climate change because we're, you know, we're sure not. (laughs) That's... Such a gentle Very way of putting it. Sadly. Yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, they're cutting down uh, on coal at home. But talk to us about how China's coal addiction um, has been exported to, to Africa, probably through their uh, the Belt and Road initiatives. Africa is a place where a lot of folks are, are pretty worried about in the next 20 years um, of growth and, and pollution. And again, like India, you know, they deserve to to be able to do what they need to grow after hundreds of years of you know, white people exploiting that that continent and its people. But China building coal everywhere is probably not wonderful. Um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely true. That's not something that I really get into in the book. Yeah. Um, but Africa is sort of, you know, I think a really important continent for the air pollution story, too. And one issue there is that there's not really very much monitoring. Mm. So it's almost like we don't even know, you know, how bad it actually is. And the other really important driver in Africa is that it is urbanizing so, so fast. Um, You know, so you're getting these huge cities that are just growing and growing. There's a lot of dependence on um, dirty cooking fuels, these smoky, you know, whether it's like wood or, or dung or straw that people burn. So uh, there's an opportunity in a sense, because a lot of cities are in the 
early, some of the cities there are still in the early phases. There's a lot of urbanization yet to come. So if you could get good systems now in place, you know, that would be beneficial for the future. But it's, I think, in a way, almost like a little bit of uncharted territory from an air pollution perspective because of this lack of measurement and monitoring. Right. That's right. kind of scary. And I know it's, again, yeah. it's even more complicated and I might have to do a whole show about this because, you know, not only they're, they're building a bunch of coal plants, but in some ways they're saying, okay, we'll finance it, but then you have to pay it. And then some of these countries or cities can't pay back the loans. And then it's, it's, it's yeah. very complicated, but, um, you know, you hope with like some of the clean, clean energy deals that India is managing to sign and some, some of the prices they're seeing for these things, you, uh, you hope that there's some sort of straw that makes a brack or some opportunity that makes them turn away from coal to something else. Because again, it's, it's, it's super cheap. It's easy to burn. It's understandable. That's why we were able to do what we do. Yeah, I was just going to say one thing that I wanted to come back to, because we're talking about sort of inequality between countries, yeah. and that's really important. And, and, it, and it plays into the air pollution. You know, it's developing countries that are suffering much more with air pollution. But even within our countries, inequality and, and um, environmental racism is a really important part of the story that I think I don't want to miss out on talking yeah. about. You know, if you look at a city like yours, LA, or like mine, London, you know, yes, the whole city has an air pollution problem. And yes, that affects everyone who breathes it, whether they're, you know, some rich white person in the best neighborhood or, mm -hmm. you know, a, a poor person of color in, in a much poorer neighborhood. But it is also true, the way I put it in the book is that air pollution affects everybody, but it affects some people more than others. And mm -hmm. this is really an issue that I think tracks all of the biggest fractures in our modern societies, definitely around race and around you know, socioeconomic inequality. You know, I think it's pretty obvious to say that, you know, in in a big city, if you don't have a lot of money for, you know, housing, for rent or whatever, you know, you're going to be the one who ends up living next to the big highway or next to the garbage transfer station or in LA, you know, near the ports, which are, are huge sources of truck and ship sure. pollution. Um, but it's also true that, there's a, a race element that goes even beyond that, um, you know, economic divide. I was doing an event recently with a terrific writer who's written, I think, this really important new book called um, A Terrible Thing to Waste. Her name is Harriet Washington, mm -hmm. and it's about environmental racism. And she cites this, you know, statistic that was really shocking about how much, you know, racism impacts the story beyond just you know, it's not just that Black people tend to have less money or people of color less money for, you know, housing. Um, she put out this number that if you compare the toxic exposure, and this is not just air pollution, but other environmental toxins as well, the, the toxic exposure of a, a white neighborhood where people are earning an average of $10,000 a year is the equivalent of an African-American neighborhood where people are earning 50 to $60,000 a year. Mm. So you're really, you know, pretty middle class, working class people of color who are experiencing the same kind of toxic environmental exposures as white people at a very, very low level of income. So that tells you that there's something more than right. just dollars and cents going yeah. on, whether it's, you know, segregated, uh, you know, di differential access to housing or other you know, environment, uh, other sort of ways that racism works its way into, you know, where we all live wow. and work and go to school and, and spend our days. So it's a really important part of this story. Um, and you, you hear people in the air pollution world talk about regional levels of air pollution mm -hmm. and hot spots. you know, so there's a, a number that signifies, you know, LA's air quality today or New York's air quality yep. today. But it doesn't tell the whole story. Not at all. Because there, there's going to be some places in the city that have much better and much worse Force, yeah. air quality than others. Right. And again, I, I don't think people like like London, where I know most of London's air pollution problems are centered in the in in the city, where Los Angeles, again, uh, and we've mentioned this before, Los Angeles County is what most people refer to because we have 88 cities within Los Angeles <laughs> County, uh, and it is incredibly congested throughout. And... Um, yeah. you know, the places that aren't, 
uh, are the places where it's it's not as bad and it's not near the highways. Um, but the rest of them, you know, the highways and the oil drills and the the asphalt with no trees is where the schools are. It's where these kids are suffering from urban heat and pollution and their grades are suffering and they can't sleep at night. And yes, it, uh, in, in a lot of ways, was designed that way. And, you know, again, we've talked about that before and we'll, we'll keep keep talking about that because it's, it's inherent. So uh, I do want to move into where are decisions actually being made? Where have we seen success, starting with things like the Clean Air Act, uh, to get us out of this mess? Where are the inklings of hope? And then more specifically, I guess, where, where, what are the repeatable policies uh, that can be, have been shown to be, or, or could be transferred abroad, could be repeated, could be adapted? Because this is, uh, it, it is a race, but as we have seen, like you said, the success story of what, uh, having still so many issues, but what we've been able to do in the U.S., um, the breathable pollution is something we have shown we can basically turn off. It's not like the heat that is accumulated that we're running 30 years behind and the ice is going to melt, you know, to an extent, no matter what we do at this point. You know, we, we can make a city more breathable very quickly. And so I, yeah. I really want to talk about sort of where you've seen those policies work and, and how they're being expanded and where they're being considered in other places. Yeah, that's really true. So, you know, with air pollution, you you definitely see that, you know, when you take the steps and you do the things to clean it up, most of which are to do with, you know, aggressive regulation and enforcement of polluting industries, you, you get the results, the air gets cleaner and, you know, literally people get healthier right away. So, you know, as we've been talking about, the U.S. has been sort of a story of progress over decades, going backwards a little bit now. California now is the place that I think is is leading the country and in some ways leading the world on air quality regulation and doing things to try to deal with it. It's a complicated story, though, because California has done the most and made the most progress on air pollution over the years, but it still actually has the worst air quality basically in the country, mm-hmm. you know, or, or dominates anyway, the lists of the most polluted cities. I think the top 10 largely, are still here. Yeah, a lot of them. Wow. Largely, um, largely because, you know, the car culture is so endemic there. So even though cars are so much cleaner, there's just so many of them and so many more of them than there used to be, you know, going so many more miles and so many more roads and all that. Um, but I think you're, you're you know, you, if you look at Sacramento, and I was there recently, you know, you do see some really aggressive efforts to try to deal with this. And you see also how it's intersecting with the climate agenda now, clean air and climate. You know, so it's things like um, taking steps to try to not just get electric cars out there and build out the infrastructure, but make them accessible to people on lower incomes so that it's not just like, you know, a toy for rich people. Mm -hmm. And it's taking steps like you know, trying to electrify the ports because those are hugely polluting. These gigantic container ships that come in with these containers of, you know, stuff headed for Target and Walmart and all that, you know, letting them, like giving them power outlets so that they can plug in when they're docked instead of, um, you know, running their, idling their really dirty engines Mm. the whole time that they're in the port. Just like really small seeming, boring things like that actually have huge impact for the people who live near that near there and and people further away too because this stuff also you know floats many miles so i think california's a real bright spot um in europe i i have a chapter from berlin which is you know not an air quality an amazing air quality place but it is a city that is um really doing things to try to change the car culture and to try to experiment with different and sort of more alternative forms of transportation. Um, You know, it's a, first of all, not alternative, but it has great, great public transportation, which is kind of like the, the, you know, base thing that you need, I think, to start getting people out of their cars. They're trying to start, you know, there's a, there's a movement there to try to get, you know, better infrastructure for biking. It's a really big biking city, you know, and I I've, I could have picked places in Europe that would be, you know, better air quality and better places for cycling. But Berlin kind of felt like not an unachievable dream. Sure. You know, it's not like Scandinavia or something that we all just feel like, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, perfect, super you know? cool. <laughs> However, um, right. 
not applicable. Right. Berlin, you know, Berlin is like a major capital of a, you know, the, the continent's economic engine. Right, but so, they've also like, you know, it's, it not exact, like, it's not like right. Berlin's had their shit together for 70 years. I mean, it was split in half until 30 years ago. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the, the point is like, they've had to dig themselves out of quite of a hole as well. Yeah. Interestingly, actually, that history is part of why there's much lower car ownership there than there is in other big German cities like Frankfurt mm-hmm. and Bonn. Mm-hmm. Because Berlin, like back in during the Cold War, obviously, if you were in East Berlin, you know, you you didn't really have that much money yeah. and you probably couldn't afford a car. But if you lived in West Berlin, where people were wealthier, there was really nowhere to go because you were like this little island sure. in the middle of East Germany. They had to get a visa to like leave the city. So there was a low, pretty low rate of car ownership there. And because of all this huge investment in public transportation, as they sort of tried to like knit their subway system and stuff back together post reunification, Mm -hmm. surprisingly, the car ownership rates, I mean, it's gone up since 1989, but it has not gone up by as much as you might have thought. So it's much lower than, you know, it is in, in other cities. And it's sort of a city with a, I don't know, it's got like a lot of, um, you know, young, creative, industries, it's government, it's a lot of expats. So there's a lot of things that sort of make it less likely to to be really car focused than, you know, a big financial center like Frankfurt or something where people are wealthier. Right. Berlin, there was one Berlin mayor a while ago who tried to get the city to have the slogan, um, poor but sexy. Um, poor sexy but, but sexy? Poor. So, poor but sexy, yeah. Wow. So that's not like the wealthiest city. So they don't have as as many cars. And that actually has big consequences for, I think, quality of life, not just air pollution, but, you know, noise and being able to, like, walk across the street without, you know, getting, risking your life, mm-hmm. or getting hit by a car. So it's a it's a place where there's progress, not, you know, perfection by any stretch, but there's there's stuff being done. And I, I felt like that was important to go look at I'm it. I'm going to try and see if I can make that my slogan. What's that? Poor but sexy. Poor but yeah, sexy. Sure. Yeah. We can trademark that. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, so I don't know. Berlin's already used yeah, it. Yeah, that's but, true. You know, I don't know if they trademark it. I'll look into Probably it. Probably not. Uh, yeah. Beth, our goal on the show is always to provide a specific action step that our listeners can take to, uh, to support yeah. your mission with their voice, their vote, and their dollar. And uh, yeah. we want to be strategic strategic about this because um as we've discussed you're uh, you're a journalist you're not necessarily an activist but this is something yeah. that's affecting you and me and quinn yeah. and literally everyone mm-hmm. on the planet so yeah so let's start with uh with voice um what are what are the big actionable specific questions that we all you know uh sorry sorry what are the one or two maybe one or two specific actionable questions that we that we could be asking of our representatives well, you know, I think a big thing that's going to have to happen in Washington in order to to start confronting this problem again, rather than going backwards on it, is like a, a rebuilding kind of of the EPA, mm-hmm. the Environmental Protection Agency, which has really been just under an onslaught in the Trump administration, not just, you know, like we were saying in terms of all these regulatory rollbacks, but also just this huge, huge brain drain um, of experts and scientists who are, have really been kind of the pillars of that agency and its successes over the years who have just been leaving because, you know, they don't, they don't see what the point of being there anymore is. So I think that's going to be a big challenge for a, you know, future post-Trump administration, post-Trump America, whenever that may happen. Um, and, you know, I think it's also, it's also important to ask local and state politicians, yes. as well as, you know, national politicians, what they're doing, and particularly around around these inequalities that we see in air pollution. You know, what measures are you taking, mayor or, you know, city council, to to try to make things a little bit more equal and, you know, to, to focus some of those resources on bringing better air quality to poorer neighborhoods and to communities of color? Because that's hugely consequential. Yes. Consequential. So those are, you know, this is obviously a, a an issue that's really in many ways driven by policy. So I think it can feel a little bit disempowering, you know, like how can I fix it? Mm-hmm. But I think it's also true that there are things we can do as individuals both to try to 
you know, lessen our own contribution to air pollution sure. and also a little bit to protect ourselves from it. So we can talk about that too, if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm happy. First of all, just happy that you mentioned the, uh, the local, it all, you know, it all starts, it all starts local. People always forget that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's excellent. And then, um, I guess for now we could, we'll skip vote because, you know, we're trying to keep it objective here. Um, but let's do, but yeah. let's, uh, talk about, uh, where our listeners can, can put their money, maybe something that's, uh, journalism focused. Yeah. Are there, are there things out there, uh, folks out there or where to put their money? Yeah. I mean, again, usually uh, it's like, send it to this, fund this, do right. this, but I wonder if there's something. Yeah. Buy, buy my book. Yeah. Right. Can I say, buy Oh, fuck my yeah. Book? We can say buy your book. Of yeah. course. Like, so why don't you give us all the details on the book and then, and if there's uh, yeah. anything else out there that you think is really cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the book is choked life and breath in the age of air pollution from the university of Chicago press, but not too, you know, not too academic. -y. Um, <laughs> you can get it on audio. You can get it as an ebook wherever you buy books, but I'll, I'll also put a plug in for a great organization that I'm a part of, which is the society of environmental journalists. Um, they actually gave me a, a grant to fund some of my reporting when I went to India, um, for, for this, this book and there's also the Pulitzer Center on crisis reporting, which is similarly funding, you know, really important journalism, often by freelancers or independent journalists on not just environmental issues, but that is is one thing that they do. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that this is really important. You know, obviously, we know that, um, you know, journalism is really struggling right now. The business model of newspapers and, and news websites and all that is really fracturing. And it's a time when I, I think this kind of coverage is more important than ever. So yeah, go, give a donation to Society of Environmental Journalists and the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. And they'll give it to reporters who are going out there and, and covering some of these stories. That's super cool. That's kind of exactly what I was looking for. Okay, great. Awesome. Boom, awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, we have kept you on the the, the horn quite a while. It's got to be like midnight there. I'm not even going to bother <laughs> yeah, to do the math. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you very, so yeah, very much, Beth, honestly. Yeah. yeah, it's been great talking to you guys. Thank you so much for having yeah, me on. Yeah, it's been and, fantastic. Of course, um, we, we just have a couple yeah. little last uh, quick questions we'll blow through here. Um, Is this okay. the lightning round, Quinn? Uh, I'm going to change the name of it oh, at some point, it. but I'd appreciate if you just so not do this in public her, on so the it's show. it's not a lightning round. Okay. okay. Just want to make sure hey, Beth, uh, when was the first time in your life where you realized you had the power of change or the power to do something meaningful? When I first became a journalist, when I joined the Associated Press back in 1990-something. And I saw my first story out on the wire. What was your first story? my first my first uh -oh. story i was like i was like the newsroom uh -oh. assistant and my job was really to like sort the faxes and because it was the sure. 90s and, and answer the what phones are those? but i was given i was given a press release that was something to do with i think port statistics and i was told to make it into a story of uh, something to do with imports at, at the new york port so i did that i don't think it had a byline on it some ap stories don't and it was really short but i wrote it and they put it out on the wire and it was like wow there it is that was not very glamorous that's so something cool. that's so exciting yeah but i still remember it that was like more than 20 years ago so <sighs> time flies yeah. Um, awesome. Hey, uh, so Beth, who is someone in your life that has positively impacted your work in the past six months? We're all about gratitude here. Yeah, I, I've met and connected with someone really amazing in London. Back in January, I, that's more than six months ago, I wrote a story about her and I've gotten to know her a little bit since then. Her name is Rosamond Adu Kissy Debra, and she is um, really probably the most important air pollution activist in London right now. Okay. She's a she's a mom who lost her daughter. Her nine year old died in oh is this um, the twenty thirteen. I remember them saying yeah. it was the first. Was that the first one? I, it was big yeah. news, wasn't it? When she died, because they said yeah. it was definitely because of air pollution. Well, no, it wasn't big news when she died. She was nine. It was twenty thirteen. Her name was Ella Kissy Debra, a beautiful young girl. I've seen photos of her and just really full of life. But she had terrible asthma, mm. and they lived very close to a really really big. Um, like not quite a highway, mm -hmm. but almost. And Rosamond, her mom, did not know about air pollution at that time. But more recently, she has been waging this legal um, fight and, and she's it's moving forward. She's had success, but it's not done yet. She wants to get air pollution written onto Ella's death certificate as a contributing factor to her death from asthma. Wow. So she's trying to get 
the inquest. She has succeeded now in getting a new inquest. That's what they call mm-hmm. it. I don't think we use that word, right? Investigation into the death of Ella to get air pollution written in. And I actually wrote a, an op-ed in, for the New York Times about this because I think the case is so important um, to have it written in black and white. You know, air pollution, It's we threw out all these numbers, right? Seven million people, 100,000. But sure. you never know who those people are. Right. In most cases, you can never specifically say, like, this person died because of air pollution. But she is trying to do that. And Ella's case was sort of severe and extreme enough that you may actually legitimately be able to say that. But I think to be able to put that in black and white on a legal document, air pollution killed, you know, not 40,000 people in the UK, but this little girl who you can see her photo and, you know, your heart will break. So, and I, since I wrote that article, I've gotten to know Rosamond a little bit and she's just an incredible woman. She's full of fight and and full of life. And she's got two other children, twins, who are actually around the same age as my daughter and, they, and they've met. And I've, I've just been honored to meet her and get to know her and sort of watch her fight. You know, like I said, I'm not an activist myself, uh, but as a journalist, you do kind of get this sort of front row seat, I guess, to see other people, you know, waging these fights right. and 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 sort of li- living their own stories. And, and that's been a privilege. That's pretty special. Yeah, I definitely want to dig into that more. And yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it comes back, what's the old adage, like, uh, you know, Oh, I'm going to mangle it. Something about like a, a large number is a statistic and and, and yeah. one life is a travesty. But like you said, to get that black right. and white for the first time and this little girl that has been in the news right. would um, hopefully hurt, help, help to start painting a picture for folks. Yeah, definitely. You know, putting a face literally right. on, on sure. um, this danger. Beth, what do you do when you feel overwhelmed? What's your self-care, Beth? I don't know. Sometimes I just curl up on the couch and stare at my phone, and that doesn't seem to help at mm-hmm. all. Shocking. I'm pretty sure there's science behind that. At this I don't point, know. Beth. I don't know if you. I don't know if you guys have ever tried that, but it yeah, no, really no, work. no. You um, sound like a. It I, isn't, it's something yeah. that nobody does. I have two. I guess I have two things. Number one, I really love to read, so I just like curl. I try to curl up with a book instead of with my phone, mm-hmm. and that seems to make me feel better. Mm-hmm. And I like to walk. In London, we're lucky to live right next to this sort of, you know, it's not California if you're talking about natural beauty, but, you know, we have a few trees. We live next uh-huh. to this, like, it's sort of like a, a nature preserve. It's called the Parkland Walk. Sure. Um, it's a it's a sort of, um, you know, rails to trails, kind of used to be a train line. Now it's like a, a walking trail. And you can kind of feel like you're in the woods a little bit in the middle of London. So I try to walk out there every day and that helps to just like, I don't know, get me away from my phone at least. Yeah. From Twitter. It looks really nice. Yeah, it's beautiful. This is a fun question. If you could Amazon Prime one, I think, can you Amazon Prime something from London to America? The, it's it's like, it's it's kind of um, theoretical. Yeah. And, and, and Beth, you can also feel free to not. Well, you know, Amazon, Amazon is bad for authors. Yeah. I don't know if you know about that. If you could personally <laughs> the, email, yeah. let me adjust, yeah. amend the if question. If you could send a carrier pigeon. Anything. Yeah, if you could yeah. personally from, okay. from your okay. house to uh, the White House, yeah. send a book to, oh. to Donald Trump, what book would it be? You can also feel free to um, not answer it, uh, to remain objective. Uh, well, we, <laughs> some of them are impactful, some are more fun. We've got coloring books to the Constitution. We can also cut it out if you'd feel free, if you're not interested. But uh, it's fun. Um, well, I don't know if I would send him my own book. That seems a little bit. We've um, definitely gotten that answer on I, yeah. I would, I would send him, um, field notes from a catastrophe by Elizabeth Colbert, who I think is just, she's my journalistic heroine. And that was such an important book on climate change. Awesome. Very good. Easy. Done. Yeah. Um, Beth, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for making the time to do this for, for all of your work and, and the travel and the, uh, and the, the efforts that went into it and for dialing it back to this is why these things have happened and this is what we're doing uh, to get out of it in places and where it's working and where it's not because that, I think, uh, really does help inform change because it, it does show blueprints of, of uh, we learn more from the mistakes we make than from our successes seemingly always. Yeah. yeah. So we appreciate that and uh, for your coming on the show. Uh, thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you guys for all the really smart questions and for the great conversation it's really been fun talking oh, to it's you. all because of coffee but thank you so much ditto same here right, same here we'll talk to you soon okay thanks so much <laughs> okay thank all you right. bye
Thanks to our incredible guest today, and thanks to all of you for tuning in. We hope this episode has made your commute or awesome workout or dishwashing or fucking dog walking late at night that much more pleasant. As a reminder, please subscribe to our free email newsletter at importantnotimportant.com. It is all the news most vital to our survival as a species. And you can follow us all over the internet. You can find us on Twitter at important, not imp. Uh, just it's so weird. Also on Facebook and Instagram at important, not important. Pinterest and Tumblr, the same thing. So check us out, follow us, share us, like us. You know the deal. And please subscribe to our show wherever you listen to things like this. And if you're really fucking awesome, rate us on Apple Podcasts. Keep the lights on. Thanks. Please. <laughs> and you can find the show notes from today right in your little podcast player and at our website, importantnotimportant.com. Thanks to the very awesome Tim Blaine for our jam and music, to all of you for listening, and finally, most importantly, to our moms for making us. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks.